I think we're almost ready to start. Um, one, one thing I will mention, I probably didn't mention earlier, is that all of the uh, presentations that, that we're having today, we're, we'll, we will post those on our website. So if there's something you missed, like that long list of references, you can, you can look to those presentations later, as, as well as the video from, this, from the, um, the workshop. So I think we're ready for Dr. Bruce Herbold formerly with the EPA, and he's going to tell us about life. Please allow me to introduce myself. <laughs> Good morning. Um, so you've heard from the regulatory agencies why they're interested in interior delta flows. Um, in response to an anonymous panel member's request to have an overview, I'm going to try to give you my overview. I've been working in the system for a long time, and uh, I think I share a flawed conceptual model of how the system works. I'm going to try to give that to you. And then also everybody talks about adaptive management, and we have actually done something like adaptive management, at least most of the Healy diagram adaptive management. Um, and I'm going to describe that. That's the Vernalis adaptive management plan. Before I do that, though, I'd like to just uh, step back because one word has been used, which if you have not been indoctrinated into the system yet, um, Mike might be confusing. That is the word salvage, which is the number of fish taken off of the fish screens in the South Delta. And those screens are behind that, for the state project, are behind the holding reservoir that, that Matt described. And from the little that we know, it seems about 90% or more of the fish that enter that reservoir are eaten, lost, die, whatever, before they ever get to the screens. So salvage, the number of fish seen, is some small unknown fraction of the number of fish entrained. And as we talk about that, it's, it's a useful thing to hold in mind. It is one other large area where we don't know how the number in hand represents the number in the field. So that's now starting actually with the presentation. Uh, and I should have gotten trained on this. There we go. I can do that. As Matt said, this is where the Pacific Ocean interacts with the bay. Um, the Pacific Ocean, as you, and, and this is going to be at the 30,000 foot level for, for a starter, um, because we are all very parochial. Uh, and we tend to lose sight of the larger picture. And I'm going to try to have a large picture here. And that is for, starting off, the Pacific Ocean holds half the water in the world, and it affects our climate, it affects our weather, it drives everything. One of the nice things about salmon is that when the ocean conditions are bad uh, for salmon, often that produces good conditions for them on land, that we get um, nice spawning conditions when you're going to have a hard time growing up or when those adults did not have a good time in the ocean. So there's a kind of uh, broadened portfolio that our fish use. A lot of our fish, our anadromous, our sturgeon, our salmon, our, our uh, other lampreys, all rely, I think, I think, to some extent, on that mixed portfolio of getting what's good in the ocean, or if it's not good in the ocean, getting when it's good on the land. Um, I, I just, just, also, just, just while we're looking at the estuary, all of that water from the Golden Gate up to the Sacramento and Stockton, that quantity of water in the estuary is about 5 million acre feet. And it's the only way that I have found yet to, to conceptualize how much water we actually move around in this system. Because out of the South Delta, in a uh, usual year now, we're taking about 6 million acre feet. So in a given year, we're moving more water than is in the entire estuary at a given time. So that's the only way I've found that that makes any kind of sense of 6 million acre feet. And it's the impact of the estuary is, uh, I mean, the impact of the ocean on the land through the tides and, and other factors is influenced strongly by what the land looks like. So back in 1873, we had this very dendritic, very complex, very tidal energy absorbing system uh, with lots of dead ends so that the tides didn't have the effect that they have now. We also had two major rivers, one coming down with a bunch of braided channels from the south of San Joaquin. That was a really complex system, lots of, of interesting stuff going on, and more of a floodplain river coming down from the Sacramento with simpler channels flowing more or less straight to the bay, except for that they'd flow out onto the floodplain. 
So very different between what, say, the winter-run salmon were seeing when they came down the Sacramento versus when the uh, spring run were coming out of the San Joaquin. Now, it is this very odd-shaped, as Matt said, lake. Everything is connected. All the, all the water within the, the delta is within a tidal uh, movement uh, of, of any other bit of water, and it all swirls around. The channels are deeper, and so the tidal energy is less diffused. We can have more tide coming in. It is having now the effect not of moving water in and out of dendritic channels, but of swirling it all around. And so we have effectively a lake, a very, very funny-shaped lake. It's worth noting that this is an inverted uh, delta. If you were to look at this picture of a delta somewhere else, you'd expect the water to be flowing in from the river channel on the, on the uh, west and, and dispersing through all these uh, deltaic shapes, shaped things on the, on the right-hand side. But in fact, uh, it is, of course, all converging and going into the bay through a, a narrowing. And that influences a lot of what affects our fish. In the tides, we, we, when I started working in the system, we had a picture of net flows as driving what fish did and not paying much attention to the, the tides because they were just seen as sloshing water back and forth, not as the dynamic and important part of, of fish movement that, that we have come to appreciate. And they're huge. Tidal flows at Chips Island are about 300,000 or more uh, cubic feet per second twice a day. And the river flows are 20,000. So if we're talking about river flows carrying anything downstream and into the bay, it's through a, a, a tidal uh, dynamic that in the course of that gets into that lake and sloshed around. So if you are coming down trying to get to the bay, river flows are going to be a very small part of what carries you there. Today, well, actually two days ago, when, when I put these numbers on, just to put that in context, I'm sorry, I'm missing one bit. And those tidal energies get much less as you move up into the estuary and, and that tidal energy gets dispersed. And I just draw your attention down here in San Joaquin. Sorry, San Joaquin, I'll do it up here, as I should be doing. I, I hate laser pointers, so I generally won't do this. But just notice that the 1,000 to 2,000 in and out, the difference represents the water being exported on this average summer day that's being modeled here. Um, and we have one to 2,000 up in these narrow channels of San Joaquin. In the middle delta, it's 47 to 58,000, they say. And um, out here, it's in, in the hundreds of thousands range. So it rapidly declines. And this gets down into the range of where the river flows are. This is nowhere near what the river flows are. So as you move in, we get more riverine. As you move out, we get more tidal. And it's all dependent on what the river flows are. When, in February of 1986, the river was flowing out at 500,000 cubic, 500, cubic feet per second, then it was a river, very riverine system. And we were all praying that we did not get washed away. But that doesn't happen very often. So most of the time, there's some balance between the tidal uh, estuarine energy driving hydrodynamics and riverines. And yes, Sam, I'm trying to keep it within my time. Two days ago, April 14th, in the balanced protection between fish and uh, water projects that was developed um, in, the, in the removal of some water quality standards that was part of that balancing act, um, we had a hydrodynamic of net flows that looked like this. San Joaquin was flowing in at 800 cubic, uh, 850 cubic feet per second. Uh, San, uh, Sacramento was flowing in. God, I'm going to use the, the pointer twice. Uh, at about 10,000 cubic feet per second. And the exports were about 3,800 cubic feet per second. Most of that was on the federal side, which is closer to the San Joaquin. So with the inflowing San Joaquin River flowing in at 850 cubic feet per second and the exports next door taking 3,300, not any of that San Joaquin water was getting out there. And if you were a salmon trying to get out, I, unless you were following the stars, I don't know how you would find uh, the, the uh, bay. If you're coming down on the San Joaquin side, the Delta Cross Channel, as Lee said, was closed. So you're staying in that main river channel. The main area where the adult Delta smelt would be hanging out, the low salinity zone, although they're now all up spawning somewhere, uh, moved far in. Usually in a, in a year, it would no be, be no further in than, than uh, the confluence. But outflow was only 5,100 cubic feet per second. And so that low salinity zone was farther in here. That freshwater lake was, comp was constrained in between that low salinity zone and the, uh, the interior delta. So that's kind of the way it is probably today. I didn't check, uh, but 
we had down here a river system that was all flowing towards the pumps. That was 3,300 cubic feet per second, or 38 if you put them together, uh, compared to 850 coming in from the south and 10,000 from the top. So mostly tidal driven, except for a fairly significant river flow down this way. And I say river flow and all the rest of this, and we always just ignore the fact that the delta is filling and draining, that there's huge impacts of the deep tidal cycle. So if you're talking about a fish, and you're talking about fish distribution, and you're not uh, looking at what the neat uh, spring tidal conditions are out there, you're talking generally nonsense. We have a nice accounting system that tells us what the daily net flows are at uh, about 34 spots, and it's, it's useful. And that's the green line for this time period. And then this is the actual measured tidal flow uh, in and out of the delta. And, and it's, it, it, it's vastly different. And it's just nobody manages to keep that in mind except John Bureau. You're welcome, John. You can talk, you can talk on something else then. <laughs> and he will. Uh, the rivers. Then we might as well, uh, the rivers before supported a lot of uh, wetlands, a, a whole large lake that we don't have anymore down here, Lake Tulare. Um, and as in the delta, they were all dendritic. And up here, they were all wetlands with large floodplains, especially on the Sacramento side. Interesting stuff in the San Joaquin. Mostly now those rivers have been, uh, from the San Joaquin side, diverted away before they get to the delta, which is why the San Joaquin is so small. Uh, we, we tap those rivers before they get to the delta. The Sacramento delivers water into the delta from which it is then exported, and it's also used along the way from Sacramento, but the Sacramento is still sort of more of a river because it's used as a, river, as a water conduit. But we have the, the, the largest water project on the face of the planet. We move more water than anybody else, and we will continue to have that honor for about 30 years until China catches up with us with their Three Rivers project. So what did we do to those rivers? The Sacramento River uh, it was interesting because it was fed mostly by uh, runoff of rain, rain on snow. And so you'd get a peak on average uh, in, in February, March period. And then the San Joaquin was fed mostly by snow. So it was fed mostly by snow melt. So it would peak in April, May, June. So we'd have five or six months of really good flows to the delta. If we look at what those upstream diversions did, they didn't do nearly as much on the Sacramento side because they're using the river for, uh, as, a, as a delivery system as we on the San Joaquin side where we diverted that water upstream. And so we pretty much flatlined San Joaquin at a very low level. Most of the water in the river now uh, for a lot of the year is agricultural return flows um, and the peak has just gone away. So correspondingly, interior delta flows that used to peak it later in the year in the South Delta, because that was when the San Joaquin was coming in, ju just doesn't happen unless we have a really odd year. The third major thing we've done is we take a lot of water out. And so this is just a quick graph of exports out of the South Delta through time. The Fed started in 1957. And, I'm sorry, whoops, ah, yeah. Ah. Back, I say, thank you. Um, and the state came on later. The feds rapidly came up to a maximum, and they keep at their maximum in most years. That's the red line at the bottom, and you can see that through time, they, they got up to that maximum early and kind of stayed at that. All the increase has been because the state has managed to take more and more water. The little blue rectangles are droughts. Interestingly, in Pat Brown, who developed the state water project, or, or finally opened it up, uh, we had oh God, 40-some-odd uh, years without a drought. We had a major drought in 28 uh, eight to 34 that sparked the need to develop that, and then we had fat and happy times until 1976. And so as we developed the State Water Project and we were thinking about what we were going to do with that water, we were living off the fat. And then we started getting droughts, and now in Jerry Brown's uh, career and my career, we've had five droughts uh, since then. So, uh, or, I'm sorry, four droughts since then. I'm, I'm, I can't even count anymore. 
Uh, and, but we have a pattern. Droughts come always in more than one year, and we always manage to increase our exports in the first year of a drought, and then run out of it in later years of the drought. Um, there might be a different use of that reservoir in the first year of a drought. We might expect that we would need that water in the second year of a drought because droughts always come in more than one year, but we have not yet started doing anything about that. Instead, we take as much water as we can in the first year of the drought and hope that uh, uh, we'll make it through. That hope has not worked out really well for us. So that balance between rivers and uh, the tidal energy, uh, as we have made less water coming in on the rivers, we've reduced the amount of tidal impact in the, in the delta and amplified the impact of the, of the tides by deepening the channels so that we've made it much more of a tidal system, except down through the middle, and especially Old Middle River that, that uh, Matt and Lee were talking about. This now operates as a much more riverine system. It's greatly more flowing south than the San Joaquin is flowing north most of the time. Even on a daily cycle, they tend to open the gates to Clifton Court on the high tide. So as the tide is ebbing, it is flowing in and entering Clifton Court so that the flow down the old, lower Old Middle River tends to be upstream on the, ebbing, on the flooding tide and continue to be upstream on the ebbing tide. That really hit a change in about 2000. This is the first version that Pete Smith, who's sitting in the audience, uh, put together, looking at how Delta Smelt Salvage related to Old Middle River flows. And one of the things to notice is that all of the years from 2000 to 2005 that are more negative than minus 5,000 are the later years. All the earlier years, they didn't get more than five, minus 5,000. And so there's both the fact that over 5,000 you get more fit, smelt salvaged, but also through time, old middle river flows have really gone strongly negative, much more so since 2000 than before 2000. So that riverine system, the, the kind of highway to hell that Matt described, uh, uh, really clicked in and we started getting Old Middle River net flows that were comparable to the daily, uh, the tidal flow max, so that you never really got a fish out of that system. If, you, if you're talking about trying to get a salmon through the system, Lee described how we try to keep Sacramento salmon out of the central delta because that's a bad place for them. If you are a salmon entering from the San Joaquin, the goal is to try to get you into the central delta because we're trying to keep you away from the Central Valley and state water projects. So you're trying to go down the green line rather than the red line. There were studies done by Pat Brandis, who will speak after me, who has been working on this system for a, a long time. Um, and she is, uh, well, she'll be showing some data from VAMP, but some of her early data show that if you released fish below the Old River so that it was on the green line there, they did better than if you released them at, uh, on the other side or at Mossdale, where they would have a chance to go down the uh, Old River. So notice that Mossdale is up above the split and Dos Reis is below the split. So if we look at the data between those, if you release fish uh, in those two places and compare the survival downstream, this was her earlier work before the Vernalis Adaptive Management Plan, they did two to six times better usually if they went through the Central Delta, which referring back to Lee's case, was where you want to not have your Sacramento salmon because it's such a bad place to be. Stepping back, why does flow matter? At the last workshop, we talked about how flow changes salinity distributions in the lower estuary. That's not today's topic. But other things happen. You get floodplains inundated as flow goes up. River stage so that the edging edge habitats get indonated also. Velocities go up so that particles get transported down more quickly. All that happens as flow increases. Residence time in the delta goes down. So if the delta is a bad place to be, decreasing the residence time is, can be good for fish. It can also inhibit growth of things like microcystis that like a long, slow residence time. And as flow goes up, generally the proportion diverted goes uh, down. Uh, because we hit a maximum on what we can export, and as flows continue above that max, then the proportion diverted goes down. Also, of course, it's not just water that's coming in. We're getting loading of, of a variety of materials. 
And there is a balance then between how much the loading increases and how much there's a dilution effect of that more water. So there was some great work done by GS that showed that the concentrations of some uh, uh, orchard sprays got much worse in wet times because the rain would wash the uh, orchard sprays off into the rivers and increase the concentration. The farmer would go out and respray. And the next rainfall would come along, and you'd have very high flows and very high concentrations. So there's a dynamic between loading and concentrations that is not pr completely predictable. But in general, concentrations go down with flow, and loadings go up. From the fish side, we live in a system dominated by fish that respond to flow. Adult spawners move up. Young marine fish move in and use the estuary as a nursery. We used to have more of these coming all the way up into the delta in Susun Bay. Uh, we don't get so many of them anymore. Particularly starry flounder used to be caught at the, in the salvage regularly. They're never caught there now. And young fish often trigger on uh, increase in flow to initiate, initiate their movement downstream. And flows are important. And geometry is important. And just to draw your attention to the fact that this is the riprap that uh, Diane was talking about. This is, this is salmon habitat on the San Joaquin River. This is the barrier keeping fish in the San Joaquin River from going into Old River. Uh, it's not what we usually think of as fish habitat. It's not at all what was fish habitat uh, in the primeval delta. So we, therefore, try to keep fish away from that. We have the Delta Cross Channel that keeps fish on the main track here. But we also then, because of Pat's work, try to keep fish from going uh, down Old River, so we put a barrier in here at the head of Old River. Uh, none of this makes any sense if you are looking at salmon biology and expect your fish to be growing up in this wetland area in the middle. The fact that we don't have much water coming in on the San Joaquin means that San Joaquin fish, and I'm going to just gauge into to the Vernal's Adaptive Management Plan here, which tried to protect San Joaquin salmon uh, out migrants. Uh, the goal, then, is to get San Joaquin salmon to move on this red line out. We put a barrier up to try to keep them from going down there. But the green area is the area that's mostly Sacramento River water. Almost always, almost all, the San Joaquin River water is going straight to the export facilities. So our goal is to try to get the water to go that way, the fish to go that way, and for the fish coming from the San Joaquin to swim through about 40 kilometers of uh, Sacramento River water to get to the bay. Some of them do it. So we, did, we are looking at a variety of measures of San Joaquin salmon, and it's clear that if you have water flowing down the San Joaquin, the salmon do better. This is escapement, return of fish two and a half years later, relative to flow at Vernalis in the spring that they went out. And the San Joaquin does flood. So, oops, sorry, I keep hitting the wrong button. I'm, so there's a nice clear relationship there unless you look at just the part where we can control. And at those flows below about 7,000 where we can control it, that relationship is not nearly as nice as it is if you throw in the 30,000 and 20,000 flows, which really get us good fish returns. Measuring survival itself rather than escapement shows the same sort of pattern. Well, what's the role of exports? If you put exports and Vernalis flow together, you get a quite nicely predictive relationship. But it doesn't help you decide what should Vernalis flow be if you want fish out or what delta exports should be. But it does suggest the benefit of building this uh, barrier. It has culverts to allow water to come in and serve agriculture in the southern delta. That is our uh, better San Joaquin salmon habitat over there. Um, that's where we want to keep them because it's nicer habitat. I, I, can, I can almost say that with a straight face. Um, and everything is relative, yes. Um, yeah, yeah. So to try to get to that question of what should flows and exports be, we set up a 12-year study, federally funded, 12, uh, federally and state funded, 12-year uh, study on salmon survival through the Delta. It had an experimental uh, uh, design that I'll describe. 
And we had a variety of ways of measuring uh, fish through there. Mostly, at, as we were starting, we were using uh, escapement, and we were using uh, coated bar tagged young fish, which requires a lot of fish. Some of the things constraining us is that that barrier that we were convinced was good can only be put in if the San Joaquin is flowing at less than 7,000. Other than that, the barrier contributes to flooding, and we don't want to be flooding the, the local lands. The smelt opinion that came out at the same time, the first smelt opinion, required that exports be half of Vernalis flow, which was consistent with that ratio uh, graph. So, okay, well, that, that means that we'll, uh, Vernalis will be twice what the exports are, and that can't help but be better than, than it had been. On the other hand, uh, the exports serve some local areas and pretty much have to be a minimum of, of, of 1,500. So the flows couldn't be more than 7,000. Exports couldn't be less than, uh, less than 1,500. And so those were the experimental parameters we were trying to work within. Uh, if you follow that through, then you can end up with a little matrix of conditions where, and this is what we ended up with, at one level of exports, we had three levels of San Joaquin River flow. And at one level of uh, river flow, we had two levels of exports. This arranged, this, this allowed us to meet the smell opinion requirement that uh, flows be twice what the exports were, meet the 1,500 minimum export requirement, not go beyond the 7,000 inflow requirement. And then we also threw in a D there to try to see if the relationship between flows and exports was nonlinear. We had good intentions. But the really amazing thing is that the guys on the San Joaquin and had never tried, had never communicated what their operations were going to be. And now they were going to try to target a flow at Vernalis, way downstream of, their, uh, of the reservoirs that they had control over, each on, on, run by a different party. And we succeeded. I, I just, uh, there were a lot of people who said they will never be able to get anywhere near that target flow. There were 6 a.m. phone calls every day of every reservoir operator on that system seeing what had happened the previous day and adjusting the outflows accordingly. And you can see we, we about doubled the San Joaquin flow for that pulse period. And we were pretty good. We, we, we allowed a 7% uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Margin Not margin of error. No. Yeah. Tolerance of, of, of what we were shooting for was plus or minus 7% 7 of what we had. So, um, and we, we generally got it. It was, it was uh, quite a surprise to many people who are very familiar with San Joaquin that that could be done. But we control this system. We can, we can nail it. And as you can see here, this is the reservoir, the, the four different reservoir releases that contributed to that flow. And it changed from day to day. Uh, as one reservoir was tailing off, another one would pick up that. Overall, we'd get the 7,000 downstream or whatever we were targeting. Oh, this was, this was 3,200. Uh, and it was uh, one reservoir was really nice and constant. That was the federally run one. The other three were, were uh, interesting. But they, uh, nice, lots of coordination. Exports are a little easier to control. We, we hit the export target without much effort uh, and it was also a substantial change from the baseline exports generally. Unfortunately, we never got the high flow conditions. We had three years that were too wet where the flows were off the, off the mark. We had one year that was too dry to, to allow this to happen. And the rest of the years, we had uh, flows that didn't allow a distinction between two levels of exports. So we had fun. It took a lot of fish. We were releasing the fish. We released the fish in two areas, in the delta and upstream of the delta on the San Joaquin. We then would try to recapture those fish that we'd released. We were succeeded. We caught a lot of other fish. We also caught a lot of delta smelt, which interfered with our progress also, because that purple area represents both our uh, recapture site and most delta smelt habitat. And they worked their butts off. The time sampled in that month, in those 31 days, uh, was usually more than a third of the time, often almost half the time, people were out there sampling. We released a bunch of fish, 
As you can see here, we recaptured from the upstream releases, not very many, from the uh, comparison releases nearby, not very many, but they were consistent with what we had thought survival was from earlier studies. So it was depressing, but, but uh, we, we were feeling it was probably accurate. We also suffered from the fact that we started this in 2000, and as you can see here, this is the salmon coming back to the San Joaquin, and we were on the descending limb of San Joaquin salmon abundance. So as we needed more fish, we kept getting less and less. And then in, as we hit 2006, we didn't get very many fish at all. So we were running out of fish and needed to find some other way to do that. We were also in despair because all the other time periods, the, uh, the gray bars are salmon, the, the gold bars are flows two, two and a half years earlier. And you can see that usually there's a nice relationship there until the latter years in which we had flows that did not produce fish. So we had a long-term experimental design. We targeted management needs. We massively experimentally manipulated the system, but we did not get all the experimental conditions, and so the conclusions were limited. We are now using acoustic tags and getting a lot more detailed and interesting information. Uh, it's unclear where we're going to go because it's hard to get a 12-year study funded. Thank you. How's my time, Sam? Good job. We got it done on time. So we probably have time for a couple of questions. If you're as depressed as I am, you know, it's, uh, then, then, then I communicate that. I had one little one, although since you, since you gave John's talk for him, maybe he, he would be a good person to answer it. Uh, uh, John's actually a hydrodynamicist instead of fish yeah, biologist, which yeah. I am. I, I, I'm just a dilettante. Yeah, but I've been a dilettante for a long time. Now, right? uh, the question was, you, one, a lot of the kind of conceptual pictures have to do with mean flows, and Matt did a nice job of talking about things involving tides. But one of the ones that struck me, because it has to do with sort of food web, nutrient biogeochemistry issues, was this concept of residence time. And it seemed like you were defining it in terms of the, the straightforward mean flow through the system as opposed to the possibility that tides also affect this. And the reason I bring this up is that number gets thrown around for South San Francisco Bay of 180 days based on very small flows. We know that that's really wrong. That's off by orders of magnitude because of the tides. So I was just wondering, has anyone done that kind of careful thought about how residence time is affected actually by combinations of tide and various flow configurations? As far as I know, we can't even agree on how to define residence time in this system. Um, what scale of you, you want to define as being a resident of uh, since the tides swoosh water all over everywhere um, that, that makes, makes it challenging just simply to define are we talking about residence time in the estuary uh, which gets ugly um, I don't know uh, it is, I feel the true statement that as flow goes up residence time goes down and that as residence time goes down, there are things that happen. Quantifying that, I, I think we are still at the general discussion level. But we seem to be, our flows have been stabilizing a lot of the year. So one of the things that we came out in, the, in studies of the last 15 years is that what used to be summertime conditions that would start when the rains ended in June um, and then would would change uh, with some operational conditions in, in October and November. Now, the conditions rapidly stabilized as soon as July 1 hits and new standards are, are in place and do not change again until either the first major winter storm or the next major change in regulations that happens on February 1st. So we can have summertime conditions out there with long residence times promoting microcystis growth, uh, doing all kinds of, of other ecological things, um, much more in the last 15 years than previous to that. But quantifying exactly what residence time is, I could get you five people and th that would be knowledgeable and they would not make any progress uh, locked in a room for a week. But that's why you're here. I can you can... A bit of to, uh, Steve's if I could. 
Red button microphone. Okay. I can add uh, a few uh, lines of information to Steve's question. I think, in my mind, I can recall at least two studies uh, for uh, sand monitor resident time in, in the Delta. One is uh, published in uh, San Francisco, what's that, watershed? History and watershed. History science. and watershed journal. Yeah, uh, that's for uh, winter run. Winter run uh, running down from Sacramento River, for example, starting uh, at Knight's Landing and then pass through Chips Island. They could spend two to three months there for winter run, okay, that section. Also, um, Perry, Russell Perry uh, did uh, uh, three year studies, six studies. Uh, that's for Red Fall Run, uh, Chinook Salmon uh, survival studies. So they released those small, much lower watershed, close to, I, I believe, close to um, Freeport, that area. And then uh, I think, I think Perry is there too, yeah. Uh, if I'm wrong, correct me, yeah. Average time from that area passed through to Chips Island, uh, it's about 15 days for later fall run. Yeah. Okay. So it depends on whether you're talking about fish, water, microcystis, or whatever else, nitrogen. Um, it, all the, uh, so it's ugly. From the San Joaquin side, comparable stuff would suggest that San Joaquin salmon smolts take about 10 days to get through the system. But is that residence time? No. It is for them. But it's not for you. Yeah. I have a question about the influence of other variables. When I think about uh, reservoir releases, I typically think of low turbidity of water. When I think of uh, high flow in a ridge river caused by rainfall, I think about high high turbidity, and I've heard a number of presentations and papers that we've read identify turbidity as being one of the key variables in explaining survival and movement and, and everything else. So could you uh, maybe explain a little bit about decoupling turbidity and, and flow in your analysis? Sure. Um, it was interesting that the reservoir releases that, that fueled VAMP were generally nice, clean, clear water that was coming down into a system that, that had been up to that point of very turbid. So there was, a, there was a lot of sand movement, there was a lot of sediment movement, there was some suspension, but, the, but we were doubling the river flow with very clean, clear water uh, early in the spring. So it wasn't getting sediment loads from the surrounding rivers. Um, so we were, we were putting down a, 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 a pulse of pretty nice, clear, cold water. Um, we were not looking at predation at that time because we had no way to look at predation. We're starting to look at that now. But one of the things that happened uh, three years ago was we had a very dry year with uh, uh, very clear water. And the acoustic tagged fish did not make it at all. They, they died very early on, seemed to uh, be lost to predation rapidly. The next year survival increased greatly and flows increased greatly and turbidity increased greatly. Um, so I, I think there is a role there. I'm not sure how to decouple flow, except for the San Joaquin pulse flow, where we're using reservoir releases to, to really bulk up the river flow. As you say, most of the time, river goes up, turbidity goes up. Is it flow? Is it turbidity? Um, that's, it's hard to parse that apart. I'm not sure how useful it is. Um, there's a lot of talk about trying to use turbidity to manipulate salvage pro prospects, but most of the water in the delta is Sacramento River water. So if Sacramento River water is coming in at a given turbidity, most of the delta will be carrying that river water, not so much the little bit of sediment being carried in by the San Joaquin. Sure. The reason I, I raise the point has to do with the solution space uh, that you're exploring. So uh, in, in reservoirs, if you try to relate fish production to hydrology, what happens is you get these nice relationships between wet years and fish production. But then when you try to manipulate reservoir water levels uh, without considering the hydrology, you get a relatively poor response, which is very much in parallel with your finding. So the lesson for reservoir managers is that you need to take what Mother Nature gives you 
So if you want to increase flows to manage fish, then it should be done at a time perhaps when, when turbidity would be high, whereas if you take a management action in a uh, time when you would expect turbidity to be low, then you probably aren't going to get the response that you might anticipate if you only manipulate flow. Yeah. Um, and, and a nice thing on the state board is really pursuing the idea of a uh, percent of unimpaired flow as the flow committed to fish protection. So that would be timing it in the same time as when the, the natural flows are happening, especially for wild fish. That, that, might, that, that has a lot of uh, uh, reason to think that might be good. But uh, for the VAMP studies, we were using hatchery fish and releasing hatchery fish into the water that we had just released. So all of the natural cues that they might go with the flow, uh, all, all that sort of goes away. So there's, there's, when you don't have any fish, it's really hard to do science. Yeah, yeah, Bruce, you'll be around all day, right? I'll be around today and tomorrow. I had a more general question to ask Bruce, and it's actually something that might be good if Bruce and Matt were both sitting next to each other. Okay, can we take, take half like this afternoon? Yeah, then? yeah, that'd okay. be great. 